we're all online all the time, streaming, chatting or checking social media. At the same time, many of us worry about climate change. So how much do our digital lifestyles damage the environment? And can apps and tech help us manage climate change? Climate protection and a digital lifestyle. Can we have both? That's our topic today on SHIFT. A single Google search uses as much electricity as burning an energy-saving light bulb for five minutes, about 0.3 watt-hours. Currently, the internet accounts for more than 1% of the world's electricity consumption. That may not sound like that much, but it is. In fact, our internet use consumes more electricity per year than Canada's 35 million population. And most of that power is used to do exactly what you're probably doing right now streaming videos. The internet consumes more than 500 terawatt hours of electricity a year. And almost 80% of this is used for streaming videos on Netflix, YouTube, Vimeo and similar platforms. To use less data and thereby electricity, we should download content instead of streaming it multiple times. Watching the regular TV broadcast uses even less energy. You can also save electricity by playing videos at a lower resolution. And if you're watching on your phone, you hardly notice the difference in picture quality. Finally, turning off your camera during video conferences can save up to 90% of CO2 emissions. But how much of a difference can that make when other parts of our digital lives are consuming more and more energy, like Bitcoin? In mid-April, the cryptocurrency hit a record high of more than 50,000 euros. Even more miners are now hunting for coins, the server farms are expanding, and all the miners are in a race against each other. Because whoever is the fastest gets the new Bitcoin. This consumes so much energy that these days entire power plants are being run just to mine Bitcoins. This power plant in Norilsk, Siberia used to belong to a nickel smelter and is now being used for a Bitcoin server farm. Over in the US state New York, this old coal power station was revived and converted to gas solely to provide a Bitcoin farm with energy. It's estimated that at present the global Bitcoin blockchain uses around 110 terawatt hours a year which is roughly equal to the Netherlands' electricity consumption. For climate researcher Jonathan Donges, this has become a societal issue. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin already require lots of computing power. And as they grow, so too does their energy consumption. So isn't this also a dangerous development for the climate? We need to look for alternatives that use less energy. Many say cryptocurrencies also need to become cleaner. 70% of all Bitcoin mining takes place in China, where coal-generated power is cheaper. Chinese Bitcoin mines alone produce more CO2 every year than the whole of Denmark. This troubles China's government. And it also bothers Elon Musk. In May, Musk tweeted he was suspending Tesla purchases with Bitcoin and said Tesla may part with its massive Bitcoin collection. This promptly caused the price of the cryptocurrency to nosedive from around 50,000 euros to under 35,000 euros. If Bitcoin is going to be greener, it needs to use renewable energy. But is that even realistic, considering how much electricity Bitcoin uses? Its big competitor, Ethereum, is going another way. Rather than having all computers in the network check transactions at the same time, as Bitcoin does, they are working toward having single computers do the verifying. This could save up to 99% of the energy used. Of course, not all tech harms our planet. Some can even help us understand climate change better, like in Antarctica. This robot uses big data to protect marine life. The battery-powered glider collects data on the iceberg 868A and transfers it via satellite. When it broke away from Antarctica in 2017, A68A was one of the biggest icebergs ever recorded. Since December 2020, it's been melting in the South Atlantic. The robot measures the effect the melting ice is having on salinity, temperature and chlorophyll levels. This will help us understand how melting icebergs affect water quality and thus marine life. 
One important consequence of climate change is that the water surrounding the Antarctic is getting warmer. This could really accelerate the melting of glaciers, which in turn would lead to rising sea levels. So we need to understand these processes better. That's why the data from this region, even if we don't have much of it, is really important. In the UK, drones like these help monitor river conditions. With their high-resolution images, they can accurately document changes in the river flow and course, and in a fraction of the time it would take to do a field study. Researchers then work with the images to assess the effects climate change is having on rivers, which also helps plan flooding protection. Research teams mapping the Indian Ocean near the Seychelles are hoping their work will provide an ocean health check. The depths of the ocean and its biodiversity remain largely a mystery. Now marine researchers are using sonar to map the ocean floor and measure and catalogue the animal world there. They are working with high-tech submarines, remote-controlled vehicles and 15 different camera systems to create detailed 3D maps. The data is being processed by artificial intelligence. A good example of how digital technology can protect rather than harm the climate. And tech isn't just helping us collect and evaluate data. A technique combining AI with 3D printing is helping to repair the damage climate change has caused in our oceans. Just off Japan's Okinawa Island, Researchers are gathering data to create virtual 3D models of the coral reefs. This is what such a model looks like. The scientists have algorithms and software examine the virtual reefs. An AI can then help construct artificial coral reefs, which closely resemble the natural structure. The largest artificial coral reef in the world to date was constructed off the Maldives, where hundreds of 3D printed structures have been fastened to the ocean floor. Living corals were planted on the ceramic and concrete models. The world's coral systems have been severely damaged by climate change. The hope is that 3D printed reefs can help preserve what remains, or even help systems recover. But corals can only survive if the oceans don't get even warmer. And although the international community signed the Paris Climate Agreement, which aims to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the year 2100, right now it doesn't look like we're keeping this goal. Some say there are alternatives, such as geo or climate engineering. These are technologies that intervene in our planet's cycles. Computer models exist of how these could help reduce the CO2 getting into our atmosphere or stop too much sunlight reaching the Earth. Here's how they work. Airplanes could disperse millions of tons of sulfuric acid in the stratosphere. The sulfur would combine with water vapor and create aerosols which reflect a part of the sun's rays so that the atmosphere underneath warms up less. But we don't know what long-term effects such an intervention would have. It could have dramatic effects. It could disrupt the monsoon or other large weather phenomena. We could see significant droughts, floods or other events. These technologies are untestable. One area of research that has been pushed for years is carbon capture. And now there are several technologies intended to filter CO2 out of the atmosphere and counteract global warming. Thousands of CO2 collectors would extract the gas from the atmosphere or filter it out from power plant chimneys. This would relieve the atmosphere of CO2 and help curtail global warming. The filtered CO2 could be stored indefinitely in former natural gas facilities, like in this pilot project in Iceland. However, there are unanswered questions surrounding this technology too. The question with CO2 storage is whether you can store the CO2 where it's been captured. Because unless you store it where it's being captured, you have to transport it, which is very energy intensive. 
Geoengineering radically alters nature, and the consequences are still very much unknown. So before we find ourselves depending on it, we should do a bit more for our planet ourselves. And there are apps that help. We can all do something to help protect our planet. One possibility is using environmentally friendly search engines like Ecosia. The company has helped plant more than 100 million trees. The more searches, the more trees are planted. Ocean Hero is another search browser extension. It collects money to help clean up the oceans. With the German app Replace Plastic, you can scan barcodes of items packed in a lot of plastic and get greener alternatives. The app's database currently contains mostly European products, but more are being added. Replace Plastic, available for iOS and Android, also automatically creates an email template that you can send the manufacturer to let them know you think less packaging is more. But can such measures really help save our climate? Those who want to test their impact can register for a simulated climate time travel due to start soon. Scientists hope the online game Skiara will prove educational. Which car do I drive? How much do I travel? What do I eat? And so on. In the simulation you can see the effects this has on climate change today, but also tomorrow and in a hundred years. You can see the impact you can have as an individual or as a group and we can all learn about our behavior's consequences. Researchers could also find out who would be ready to do what from gamers, which could lead to viable policy and business recommendations. But let's get back to our initial question. How good or bad are our digital lifestyles for the environment? I think the answer isn't clear, but I'm definitely going to pay more attention to my environmental footprint. And if you think about it, we can all have a big impact with little effort. Some people worry we've lost the fight against global warming and think fleeing to another planet could be an option. Elon Musk has plans to fly to Mars with a rocket, which we've explained on our YouTube channel. Check it out to find out why Mars can't substitute the Earth as our home. That's all from me for today. Bye and see you next time.